welcome to our brand new series called Beyond the Science. And basically, this series that we're going to be having, this seven-week series that we'll be having, is a series on the seven signs or seven miracles that Jesus performed prior to his crucifixion in the book of John. And so if you are here, you're believing for signs, wonders, and miracles to happen in your life. And if you are here, you're wondering what those signs and miracles actually mean in the Bible. If you are here, you want to know more about God. And if you are here, you're interested to invite your friends, you know, because they are wondering about, you know, signs, wonders, and miracles. We hope that you can bring them here as well in the service because for the next seven weeks, we're going to be talking about the seven signs that Jesus performed or Jesus did um, prior to his crucifixion in the book of John. Just to give you a, an overview of what we're going to be going through in the past, in the next um, seven weeks, this is what will happen. Week one, we're going to be talking about water into wine, John 2, healing of an official son. Week two, healing at the pool on, on the Sabbath, feeding, of, feeding the 5,000, walking on water. How many of you here, you want to walk on water? All right. So healing the man, man born blind, I guess if you're afraid of swimming, why not just walk? Okay, so... Healing the man, uh, the man born blind, Lazarus raised from the dead. And so if you have a, you know, take a picture of this. In fact, I'd like for you, for the next seven weeks, join us as we study this. May we encourage, may I, may I, I just want to encourage you, please do read this. Please do make this as a part of your daily devotional, daily Bible reading time so that we can dig the scriptures together, so that we can learn these stories, these accounts of miracles together because we are believing God's going to speak to us in a fresh way as we study these miracles. And so again, please do take this down. Please include this in your Bible reading. And for the next weeks, these are the topics that we will be talking about. First is water into wine. But before that, why did we entitle this Beyond the Signs? Why Beyond the Signs? I guess we would all agree that all signs in general are important. Would you agree? I mean, traffic signs, yes, as Filipinos, we have a confession. We have traffic signs here in the Philippines, but a lot of people don't follow. <laughs> okay, so uh, sometimes that's the problem here in our country. We have lanes, but we don't follow the lanes, okay? <laughs> so that's just Philippine driving for us. But yet, um, in general, we appreciate signs because some way, somehow these signs um, let us know where we're at. If you're in the mall, you have this big directory, and there's a sign there, okay, the directory or the map. And it points you where you are. And so it gives us an indication where, we're at, where we are. Or if you're traveling to long distances, you're traveling to Baguio or to Pagudpud, or you're traveling to Bicol and you're driving, you know, those road signs will let you know where you're heading or if you're still in the right direction. Those signs give us warnings. Those signs give us instruction. Those signs give us information. Last week, I mentioned to you that we just came from a... 10-day uh, study, uh, study trip to Israel, and I was just amazed actually at the different road signs that they have and the different signs that they have there to instruct people. Like this sign that I found there, um, there's this sign there that says uh, the city of Nain or Nine, and it says there the significance. The significance is that city is where Elijah resurrected the widow's son. And so amazing that they would also put this, 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 the biblical or the scriptural significance of the city because all throughout Israel, you would find their cities left and right and they have biblical importance and significance. And so I guess it is an information, it's an informational tool for those who are uh, internationals or foreigners in the land so that they would appreciate those cities and places. Now, when we went to um, Caesarea, the area, the, I guess the part where it's close to the, uh, we're adjacent to the Mediterranean Sea, um, there's this place, and it's a huge, huge area, Caesarea Martima, a place that the Romans built, and this is where uh, Pontius Pilate built a city, uh, built his palace. Can you see those ruins there? Okay. And those, the, you see the, the drawing there, that's the artist's rendition of it. That, it used to be, where the palace of Pontius Pilate was placed. And so it was beside the seats overlooking the Mediterranean. And can you imagine the beauty, the grandeur of this in the time of Jesus? Now what happens is, again, if, if this is not there and then a visitor comes there, a visitor would just say, wow, the, the sea is nice. 
Wow, the breeze is fine here. Wow, look at those rocks. It's beautiful. But then because of these signs, you are informed, wow, it's more than the breeze. It's more than the rocks. It's a historical validation of the accounts of an account in Scripture. A historical by a valid, an archaeological validation that Jesus was true and that Pontius Pilate that the Bible is talking about existed 2,000 years ago. There's another sign there when we went to Bethesda and we're going to be talking about this in the series. It says there, there's a sign there at the bottom of the, of the pool. It says there, Jesus, sick, uh, Jesus healed the sick man near these medicinal baths in John chapter 5. And so, again, when you look at these signs, it gives you information that somehow will allow you to appreciate what is or what has happened in those places. But again, our scripture is not about just signs in general, but it says beyond the signs. It's a question, why do we say beyond the signs? Why beyond the signs? See, when you go to those different places, I am sure, I am sure you, would, you two would be mesmerized. Mesmerized by the different signs, the different places, the different artifacts that are being shown, the different ruins that you will see. And the problem with being mesmerized with the sign is at times you will miss the message of the sign. Do you get that? If you are to focus with the sign in general, you would miss the message of the sign. For example, if you're heading towards Baguio, and right there in Enlex, you saw a big, huge, colorful, with blinking light sign, Baguio 100 kilometers away. You were so mesmerized by the blinking lights, you just stopped there at the Enlex and with the sign, and then you camped there and you stayed, wow, Baguio is really good. How many of you know you haven't even experienced what Baguio is because that is just the sign. The same thing is true with the signs that we will be looking at. See, a lot of people in Jesus' time, they were so enamored with the signs, the miracles themselves, that they failed to see the message behind those signs. And so that is why we're having this series. We're going to take time today and even in the next weeks so that we would understand what those signs are about. Because signs in general, they point to something or to someone. Signs in general, they point to something or someone. And so it is incumbent upon us to know what these signs are pointing to or who these signs are pointing to. What do those signs mean? In fact, let me just give you a teaser already, as an overview of sorts. It's a good thing that you have the Bible today because in the Bible, in the book of John, somehow because when John wrote all of these stories, when John wrote this book, he was reflecting on what happened years past. And because it was more a reflection, somehow there were already revelations upon him. Okay? That's why you will see, you know, in some of the stories, there are already interpretations because somehow he was able to process it. And at the end of the book of John, he gave us an, the answer why beyond the signs? John chapter 20, verse 21, it says here, But these, speaking about the signs, are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in His name. Let me say it in another way. The reason why there are signs is so that you and I can know who Jesus Christ is. That we would find out, that we would get to understand that this Jesus who existed 2,000 years ago is the Messiah, is the Savior. He's the Son of God. And that by believing in His name, you and I will experience the life that He brings. If you would be stuck with the sign you would miss out on who Christ is. And you would also miss out on the life that actually is being communicated through those signs. That is why today, we're going to be starting to, you know, exegeting, looking into 
these signs so that we would experience the life that these signs are pointing to. Again, today we're going to be looking at water into wine. Okay? John chapter 2, verses 1 to 11 is our text. So please, if you have your Bibles with you, please open it to John chapter 2. And please rise on your feet as we read the Word of God. We believe that the Word of God is critical, it's vital, it's important. It is the very word of, words of God. And so that's why as a sign of respect, we stand as we read the Word of God in a setting like this. John chapter 2, verse 1. Okay? If you're there, just follow along okay? as we read this. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. In verse 1, it says, On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, mother, to her Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His, his mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone, serves the good wine first but when people have drunk freely when the poor uh, then the poor wine but you have kept the good wine until now this the first of his signs jesus did at cana in galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him you may all take your seats this is the word of god and this is what we'll be looking at today as we go through beyond the signs now again as we look at the scripture a few things that um, I just want to mention first in con in context as a context to this Jesus in John chapter 1 um, John spoke about who Christ is as the word the word of God he is God and he has become flesh and then um, he gives an account a brief account of how Jesus started his ministry when he was at the right age and at the right time, he started to recruit his followers. He started to recruit Andrew and um, Simon, and he called Simon uh, Peter. And then there were the, the sons of Zebedee. And so there were a few others. Nathaniel was there as well. And so he had, uh, uh, I think, about five or six of his disciples. Okay? Six are still yet to be recruited, but at this time he had about five to six of his disciples with him. And so they were you know, um, going around. But yet it says here that on the third day, after recruiting his disciples, they were invited to a wedding. And in this wedding, of course, Jesus was invited, but he brought his disciples with him. Okay? And so when he um, went there with his disciples, this was the backdrop of the first ever miracle that Jesus did that was recorded in the book of John. Now, to give us a framework for the remainder of my time, how, we were gonna go, how we're going to go through this, I want to share with you three things about this story, or this will be the backdrop, or this will be the frame of this sermon, and also of all the other sermons that we're going to be preaching in this series. We're going to be talking about what is the situation, what is the sign, and what is the significance of the sign. And so I hope that you, it would just, uh, I hope that this would help you have a framework of where we're going as we go, as we dig in to the scripture. What is the situation, what is the sign, and what is the significance? Of the sign when you read the other scriptures that I told you about uh, earlier think about it what is the situation there what is the sign and what do you think is the significance of the sign and so first let's talk uh, let, let's take about or let's talk about the situation what was happening again Jesus and his disciples attended a wedding and in see in here it says and the mother of Jesus was there who is this mother of Jesus Mary okay Mary was also there. Mary will, uh, you know, has a big part in this, and so please take note of that. Verse 2, Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. Verse 3, when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, 
they have no wine. So there's a wedding. Yesterday, I, I was just, uh, I officiated a wedding of one of our members. And it was such a fun time. Some of our other members were there. Um, other uh, Victory Group members were there. And we were, they were all celebrating. And so, um, just like that, this happened also in a wedding. A time of feasting, a time of celebration, a time of jubilation. Because a man and a woman will finally become one. And so, but here, the situation, the drama or the dilemma here is, in that celebration, wine ran out. Why is that so important? Okay? Why is wine um, so important in that place? Another thing, why did Mary, the mother of Jesus, know what is happening? Why is she the one who brought the matter to Jesus? Okay? I'm teaching you how to um, you know, interact with the scriptures as well by asking questions. It's good to ask questions when you read the scriptures. And not just why did Mary bring this up with Jesus, but can you imagine, okay, why did Jesus respond in that way as well? And why did Mary, okay, bring the, uh, the situation to Jesus in the first place? Okay, those are some of the few questions that we'll answer. Number one is why Mary, okay? Why did Mary know the situation? Um, in their time, in their context, they say that weddings are actually a familial you know, event. Basically, when a man or woman will get married, um, before they do get married, they get engaged. Anyone of you here, you're already engaged? Anyone of you here, you want, do you one day be engaged? All right, only two, okay? Most of you are married, okay. And so, they get engaged, and for a year, that will be their betrothal season, okay? And so, for one year, that was the time that they will plan the event. And when they plan the event, of course, it is the father of the bride who will take care most of everything. But yet, he would ask his relatives to help him because in, in weddings like um, in their time, you know, like now, kasi what happens is you have a limited guest. Some of us, 100 guests, 200, 300. But in their time, anyone in the town can go to a wedding. Can you imagine that? Of course, in their time, okay, there's, just a little, um, there's only a few thousand people existing in the area of Galilee. But can you imagine even 1,000? Just 1,000. 1,000 people attending your wedding day. One more thing about weddings in their time. Weddings usually last not just one day, but it lasts for seven days. The celebration, the reception is seven days. Can you imagine feeding people, okay? For seven days. I mean, that is why you would be needing all the help that you can get. And so some scholars believe that Mary actually is one of the relatives of the bride or the groom. And so that is why she was one of those who are hosting or coordinating. Or I guess, um, yeah, he, she's one of the wedding coordinators at that time. And so that is why Mary knew what was happening. The guests don't, but Mary knew we have a problem. Wine is running out now i guess being talking about weddings that are you know people are invited um nowadays we don't have that anymore but um you know in the province of my wife she she is from benguet from latinidad and anyone of you here from benguet as well oh we have a few here okay and so um in benguet my wife told me that during weddings somehow this is still true for them that in the weddings, they would invite hundreds of their relatives and friends. Is that true? In fact, they would have parties, they would have kanyao, and they would, you know, slaughter like several pigs and several cows and several chickens, hundreds of chickens, so that they would be able to feed one barangay. In fact, when I was still courting her, she showed me a picture of one of the weddings that took place in his family. And when I saw the picture and I saw the, you know, I, I thought there were ants, but they were people, okay? I mean, there was just so many, okay? And so that made me think, when I proposed to this girl, <laughs> where are we going to hold our wedding? And so somehow wisdom <laughs> came, to, came, to, came to us and said, okay, instead of holding our wedding in Benguet, can we just hold our wedding in Tagaytay? <laughs> so that it's going to be very far, okay? We still gave the invitations, okay? But the wedding is in Tagaytay. How rude of us. <laughs> yeah. 
But in their case, it was a different story. They would have this wedding ceremony and then the reception for seven days and hundreds of people will attend. Now, why is running out of wine such a big deal? I found out when I was researching this, I found out and even when we talked to some of the local Jews in Israel, they said that the wine actually is the center of the celebration. Because in their time or in their context, the wine symbolizes joy and festivity. And so that is the center of the wedding celebration. If you have, I mean, today, okay, when we go to weddings, normally we would, some of us would critique, right, the wedding, and some of us would critique the caterer, the overall caterer, uh, the, the food that they serve. Some of us would, you know, critique the... Uh, I guess the wedding ceremony, some of us would give, critique the souvenirs that were given. But in their context, one thing that they really look forward to is what kind of wine and how good the wines that you will serve in your wedding ceremony or wedding reception. And so that was the center of the event. And so when it started to run out, all of those coordinators, those relatives started to panic. One of them was Mary. And then Mary... Since she doesn't know how to handle it, she brought the matter to Jesus. Knowing that, I mean, his son, okay, is somehow, he knew that this, this man is, you know, a good speaker. He's, this man is a good, you know, a communicator. Maybe he could pacify the crowd by giving a short lecture or giving a short teaching or tell stories. I mean, the Bible is quiet even with the intention of Mary. Did Mary actually ask Jesus to turn water into wine? No. It was not indicated, but just she knows she needs to put the situation in the hands of Jesus. Now, our story gets more interesting because Jesus' reaction was this. And Jesus said to her, can we all read together? And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Did you get what Jesus was saying here? Actually, initially, I did not. Mary was presenting a problem and Jesus answered something different. In fact, how many of you here, you are moms? Okay, how many of you are your moms? Lift up your hand. How many moms here would like, when you bring up something with your kids, your kids would tell you, woman. What does this have to do with me? Can you imagine your little kids, okay? You have something of a problem in the house. You have, your, your rice is running out. And so somehow the mention mo dun sa anak mo na bata and then the, the kid said, Woman, <laughs> what does this have to do with me? <laughs> I'm sure it could be something that is kind of offensive, isn't it? If you're a mom and your, your, your daughter or your son calls you woman, <laughs> that's kind of offensive. But yet there's something in this story that we can learn. Because when we look at what the reaction of Mary was, she actually wasn't re- re- um, offended. She did not take offense at what Jesus said because somehow she knew there is something that is happening at this point in his son's life. There is a transition that is happening from his, or from, from her son, from a son of a carpenter, Jesus was transitioning to his ministry mode and somehow she understood this is the moment that the angel Gabriel spoke, spoke to me about before I conceived him in his mother's womb and in my womb that he would become great and he will save the people for his sins and so that's why when Jesus said woman she did not take offense with that but yet what does it mean that my hour has not yet come I want you to hold that thought because we're going to go back to that later as we proceed with the story. Okay? Are you still here? All right. Verse 5. Okay? His mother said to the servants, see, she was not offended. His mother said to the servants, do whatever. Can you say whatever? Whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. Mary said, here's the situation. Servants, do whatever he tells you. You know what? When we have that kind of a response, 
that response is critical for us to experience miracles in our lives. Because oftentimes, when we go to God with problems, with our petitions, we go to Him and we tell Him what to do. But shouldn't we, instead of telling what God ought to do, shouldn't we, just like Mary, do what He tells us to do? So a good you know, thing to think about every time we pray. When we pray, are we telling God what to do? Or are we listening so that, what we, so that we would do what He tells us to do? Verse 6, now there were six stone jars. This is the miracle now. This is the sign. There were six stone jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons each. Okay? Now, I took a, uh, we took a picture of um, one of those stone jars, and this is one of them. Lest you think that it is small, okay? The Bible says it can contain up to, what? 20 gallons each. And so if you would take a picture of this beside a person, it would be like this high. And it's huge. You cannot wrap your arms around it because it's so huge, okay? That's a stone jar, okay? Can you imagine all of the wine that Jesus converted okay, in these? In fact, I'm going to tell you later um, the approximate number. Verse 7, Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some, take it to the master of the servant. The master of the servant took a sip, and when the master of the servant called, took a sip, Talk, um, uh, call the bridegroom and then in verse 10 everyone serves and told the bridegroom you know what I have been in so many weddings I have coordinated many weddings in the past and in the past the, tra the tradition is the trend is you serve the best wine first so that when the people are already drunk they won't even know the difference and that's why you serve the you know serve the bad wine but now in this account, you, say, you save the best for last, okay? Wow. See, this was the miracle. I was telling you earlier, it can contain up to 20 to 30 gallons each. You know how many bottles of wine that can make? It can make about 900 to about 1,300 bottles of wine. And not just any wine, it says here, fine wine, the finest wine. Okay? Now, lest you think that the pastor is incapacitated, you know, we learned from Sunday, you know, it's about wine and he's encouraging us to be drunk. Okay? That's not the message okay, of the story. That's missing the sign. Okay? That's why we're discussing this okay, so that we won't miss it. The Bible is against drunkenness, by the way. And so here, about 1,300, can you imagine the monetary value of that? Can you imagine, wow, what this great miracle was now what is the significance okay the third point third part of the preaching verse 11 this the first of his signs jesus did at canaan galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him why did jesus do this miracle it is to show us his glory when you say manifested his glory, it means to show us who he is. To show his character. To show us his heart. To show us his nature. To show us his purpose. That's why he made this miracle. And what is the ample response so that we would believe? Now what are some of the things that we can draw out from this story, from this miracle? Number one, remember the stone jars? Remember the stone jars? Big jars, huge, 20, 30 gallons each. Bible says it was very specific. They were made of what? Stone, right? Made of stone. Typically in their context, they would not use stones as water jars. Because it says also there, those stone jars are for the Jewish rites of purification. Basically, what they are, are, you know, basically basins wherein people can draw water and clean their hands and clean their feet before they eat. And so that is just it. But yet the Bible specifically said stone jars. Have you ever wondered why it's stone? Okay. 
See, when we ask the locals why it was specifically mentioned stones, because in their time they say most of the Jewish rice purification basins or jars are made of clay. Clay pots or clay jars would cost about $7 each. But stone jars cost about $7,000 each. And so, thinking about the wedding, here's the family of the couple. And right at the entrance of the wedding ceremony or the wedding reception, before you enter the reception, you see these huge stone jars. You know it's very expensive. Kung baga sa wedding, when you see the, the bride, you know, exiting um, the car, the bridal car, you don't just say, you know, oh, she end, exited a white car. Okay? That is if, if it's clay. But this is a stone jar. It's as if she said, oh, she exited a white limousine. And so it was very expensive. But yet, can you imagine the dilemma of the bride at that time? Can you imagine the conversation perhaps that could have happened? Dad, why did you spend $7,000 on the stone jars just for people to wash their hands? Because of that, we ran out of wine, which is the highlight of the ceremony. Why did you waste? Why did you make that huge mistake? And now, because of that, we are, our family is in shame. Because you know what? If people are frustrated with your wedding, it could cause dishonor and shame to your family. See, but yet in the midst of that conflict, in the midst of that drama, Jesus intervened and did a miracle for them. See, one lesson that we can derive from this. Our mistakes are never too big for Jesus to redeem. Maybe you are here. Maybe you have made huge mistakes in the past. You thought that by purchasing or making this investment, my heart being invested in this person, you're making the right decision and somehow you ended up lacking. Somehow you knew that was a huge, huge mistake. Not just to yourself, not just to the people around you, but you know deep in our heart, it is a mistake, it is a sin before God. But you know what? One thing we can learn from here. Our mistakes are never too big for Jesus to redeem. See, the Bible says, the arm of the Lord is not too short to save. And maybe you are here, you're saying, my past is too dark, that's why I don't want to go to Christ. Let me tell you this. No past is too dark that God cannot shed light. And that is why I believe you're here, so that you can experience that miracle of Christ. Remember, those six stone jars, they are for water purific or for purification rites. When you say purification rites, what happens there is they have these huge basins, huge jars, and they would have these small kettles, okay? And so this is the traditional Jewish kettle wherein they would use, notice the two handles. What they say that what they do is they would use one handle and get water, draw water out from the jar, and then they would wash their hands with one, and then hold the other ear, and then wash the other hand so that the other would be clean. And then hold it again so that you can wash again the other one. So that your hands would be made clean. Those, that is what they, that's the purpose of that. In fact, it's not only present in, in, in occasions like that, but it's also present even in, um, you know, in temple. Before you enter the temple, you would also find these kettles. And then those kettles, you wash with your hand, wash the other hand and then you wash the other hand as if signifying somehow you are being made clean but the thing is for them they need to do it daily they need to do it every single time they enter into a ceremony but you know what what is amazing when Jesus I want you to listen here when Jesus miraculously turned the water into wine it is speaking of something else 
It's more than just for the sad celebration, but it is a symbol of what Jesus actually will be doing. Remember our communion? Whenever we partake of communion, we partake of the bread and the wine. What does the wine symbolize? The wine symbolizes the blood of Jesus Christ that enables us to be forgiven of our sins. See, for them, that Jewish rite is enough just for cleansing every single day. And every time they have to do this because without this, they cannot receive righteousness from God. But Jesus was making a statement. That water now has turned into wine to symbolize what I'm about to do. Because my blood will be poured. Remember, it says in the beginning, my time has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. That hour, he was pertaining to the hour that he would die on the cross. Because at that very hour, his blood will gush out. And that blood would signify, would symbolize the forgiveness of your sins and mine. Not just for one day. Just like that water but that righteousness is effective absolutely progressively and eternally our sins our sins are forgiven not just one time but for your whole life and it does not have an expiry date it is valid till eternity why can we enter to heaven because of the blood of Christ. Because we have been forgiven of our sins. That's why in John, 1 John chapter 1, it says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all, all unrighteousness. Why did Jesus make it wa that water into wine? To signify that in Christ, our righteousness, our right standing before God, our forgiveness is absolute. It is progressive. We can apply it every day. And it is eternal. How many of you appreciate the blood of Christ for us? Amen. I'm about to close now and it says again, let me quote that again. John 20, verse 31. Why did, G, why did John write this? Why did Jesus do that miracle? So that you and I may believe He is the Christ. He is the Redeemer of our mistakes. He is the Savior of our souls. He is a Redeemer of our past so that you and I by believing we will experience that life I want to close with this thought when the master of the ceremonies tasted the wine he said this is the best wine that I've ever tasted and if that wine is a symbol of the kind of life that God has for you and for me, and then we can also conclude that the life Jesus gives because of what He has done on the cross, the love that He gives you and me, there is nothing in this world that can rival the love of God. Some of you here, you've tried other wines. Some of you here, you've tried other sources of joy, fulfillment in your life, and somehow at the end of it, you feel empty and lacking still. But from this teaching of Jesus Christ, this demonstration of Christ, He's saying to you, my son, my daughter, that's nothing. You are tasting something far less. Taste my wine. Taste my wine. Because as we experience Christ, that is the only love 
that can fully satisfy all our needs. Amen? Praise God. Can we close our eyes right now? God, Lord, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your love, Lord God. Your love, Lord God, washes away all our sins. Lord, because of the blood that was poured out of you, Christ, Lord, we receive our forgiveness. And when we receive of that forgiveness, Lord God, that forgiveness is enough for us, Lord, to put away all our shame. Every now and then, we would, give, we would get condemnation from the enemy. But Lord, thank you that right now, you are silencing the enemy. Right at this very moment, Lord God, you are silencing the enemy. Some of us here, we've been plagued in the past with the condemnation of the enemy. The guilt trip of the enemy is there. But Lord, right now, you are silencing the enemy Father Lord we receive afresh that righteousness that is absolute we thank you that in Christ all things are new that we are now new creations the old is gone and the new has come thank you for that boldness Lord and I want to pray for one group of people before we end as all heads are, cl are closed and all eyes are bowed uh, all heads are bowed and all eyes are closed if you are here and you're saying God, I have tried other wines and it has failed. I tried relationships. I tried career. I tried money. I tried accomplishments. But somehow you realized it is still lacking. I believe today is your day and God wants you to taste His wine. God wants you to experience the life that He brings. It is only in the love of Christ that you can be fully satisfied. And so today, if you're saying, God, I'm making a decision. I'm saying no to all these that the world can offer, all these other wines. And today, I am receiving that gift. That wine is a gift, Lord, that you freely give today. If that is you and you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, can I invite you, with all heads bowed and all eyes closed, just lift, lift up your hands to God right now. Lift up your hands to Him. Yes. Yes, several hands lifted up. It's good. You're making this decision not before men. You're making this decision for God. You are praying to God right now. And God, I believe, is doing a miracle. God is turning water into wine in your lives right now. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters, to God, who are lifting their hands to you. God, Lord, thank you. You're doing a powerful miracle in their hearts today, in their spirits today. Lord, you're breathing life. There's new life that you're giving. There's new identity that you're giving to them. Lord God, you are transforming their lives today. Thank you that this is all because of Jesus Christ. If you are lifting your hands, can you pray this prayer with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for the life that you have lived. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sake. Thank you that because you, raised, you were raised up from the grave, I can receive a new life. And so today, I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart that you are raised from the grave. Today, God, I submit my life to you. I submit my heart to you. I submit my all to you. Be the Lord and Savior of my life. From this day on, in Jesus' name, amen and amen.